So I'm going to be talking about COVID-19 funding agreements in the United States. Conceptually, you can think of the agreements as falling into two main categories. There's the R&D contracts, and those have been mainly executed by BARDA, part of HHS, and they involve all aspects of R&D from preclinical research all the way through to FDA approval and some scaling up of manufacture. And they award hundreds of millions to $1 billion to pharmaceutical companies to develop vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics. Then there's the procurement contracts, and there are even um, greater awards of government funds. They range from one to $2 billion, and they advance purchase hundreds of millions of doses of various vaccine candidates. Um, and interestingly, many of the contracts have been entered into by an intermediary called Advanced Technology International and not the government itself, and I'll return to that point later. So overall, what have we learned about the R&D contracts? Well, like I said before, they range from hundreds of millions to $1 billion. Um, many of the agreements are other transaction agreements or OTAs, which I'll explain um, in just a moment. And in some instances, the US government is paying 80 to 100% of the development costs. So now I'll talk briefly about other transactions authority. And that's an authority granted by Congress to 11 federal agencies, including NIH and BARDA, to enter into other transaction agreements. Um, now, federal agencies treat these agreements as freedom of contract, anything goes. Unlike with traditional government contracts, there's a standard set of rules and regulations that protects taxpayers' investments and gives the government rights and IP and data. Um, including under the Bayh-Dole Act and federal acquisition regulation. And in the view of federal agencies, these contracts are exempt from all of that and it does not need to be included. They're like a blank slate. Um, so here's our, just a few quotes about other transaction agreements and they show that um, people outside the government believe that the biggest benefit of using another transaction agreement is that the government doesn't have to retain rights in IP and data um, and you can avoid all of that. Um, this is an excerpt from an NIH training document that it uses to train its contracting officers about other transaction agreements. And if you look at the middle, it says that past OTAs have included a waiver of the government license. They've allowed protections of materials as trade secrets and negotiate, excuse me, negotiation of a new definition of practical application. So to understand why that matters, just a brief over, overview of the Bayh-Dole Act. It was designed both to promote the commercial development of federally funded inventions and to protect against the non-use or unreasonable use of the inventions. Um, and in protecting against the unreasonable use of federally funded inventions, the government retained certain rights in all publicly funded inventions, such as margin rights, including the ability to march in if the contractor fails to make the invention available to the public on reasonable terms, which includes price, and a royalty-free license to practice the invention or have it practiced for on, or on behalf of the United States government. And then the rights and technical data under the federal acquisition regulation are summarized here. Um, for data that is first produced in performance of a contract with the US government, regardless of how the, the development of the data is funded, the government has unlimited rights in that data. And that is very broad, true to its name, it's unlimited and it can, it can include the government transferring the data for use by a competitor. Um, the government has limited rights in data that was developed at private expense and not first delivered under the contract. And that um, is unlimited inside the government, but more limited outside of the US government. So how does this relate to a COVID-19 vaccine? Well, HHS or the Department of Health and Human Services was issuing a lot of press releases talking about COVID-19 R&D contracts. And it said that it was using other transactions authority and expanding on pre-existing other transaction agreements to enter into COVID-19 contracts. Um, then under the CARES Act, Cong Congress actually expanded the authority of BARDA and DOD to enter into other transaction agreements for COVID-19. So KEI submitted a FOIA request for um, the COVID-19 contracts being entered into by BARDA. And after they said that the request was overbroad, we narrowed it down to six contracts. In late um, June 2020, we got those contracts. And what we saw was that um, four of the six contracts were in fact OTAs and they weakened or eliminated the government's rights in IP and data developed under the agreements, limiting the government's ability to address unreasonable prices, to authorize generic competition and to transfer technical data. So here's a summary of the six contracts obtained by KEI. And as you can see, 
Um, they are very high in monetary awards, um, ranging from hundreds of million to almost a billion dollars. And you can see um, the purpose of OTAs was to attract non-traditional government contractors, but many of the companies listed are traditional government contractors, such as Johnson & Johnson and Roche. So here's a summary of how the OTAs weaken the government rights and IP and data. So they redefine practical application, and that's the contractor's obligation with what they do with the federally funded invention. So um, under the Bayh-Dole Act, they're required to make the federally funded invention available to the public on reasonable terms. They delete the words unreasonable terms. So all the contractor is obligated to do is develop the invention and make it available to the public. They remove two of the four grounds for margin rights. They narrow or eliminate the government's royalty-free license to use the invention, and they eliminate or weaken the government's unlimited rights and data so that they're more like limited rights where the data can be used inside the government, but not outside the government. Um, this table is a side-by-side -side comparison of um, con contracts that adhere to the Bayh-Dole Act, excuse me, contracts that adhere to the Bayh-Dole Act um, and the de definition of practical application, and then the OTAs we obtained. So you can see that unreasonable terms language has been deleted. Um, the OTAs did generate some, or our analysis of the OTAs did generate some press coverage. And um, this slide is a screenshot of Chris Murphy. So there was a July 2nd, 2020 congressional hearing where members of Congress questioned the acting director of BARDA and Francis Collins, the director of NIH, about why um, these federal agencies would weaken the government rights at a time when the government is awarding massive amounts of money and the public interest and economic stakes are as high as you can imagine. You'd want greater rights, not weaker. So um, these some members of Congress asked um, very important questions and um, the response that they got from the NIH, the, the director of the NIH, Francis Collins, was that it doesn't really matter because the Bayh-Dole Act does not allow the government to march in and address unreasonable prices. And Chris, Chris Murphy responded that that's not actually the case and that there are plenty of lawyers who would say that the definition of unreasonable terms includes reasonable prices. So next I'll transition to the cost sharing under the COVID-19 contracts. Because of the redactions, we don't know the cost sharing arrangements for the majority of the contracts, but we do know um, the cost sharing for the Moderna contract in the Regeneron OTA. So the Moderna vaccine R&D contract is for development of uh, the joint NIH and Moderna vaccine candidate that Zane discussed, all the way from preclinical research through FDA approval and domestic scale out manufacture. Um, and BARDA is covering 100% of those development costs. Uh, how do we know this? Well, around the same time, Zane and I were looking at the contract that KEI obtained under the FOIA, and we saw a provision that obligates Moderna in all press releases discussing the vaccine candidate to disclose the total and proportionate funding provided by the federal government and the total and proportionate funding provided non by non-governmental sources. We looked at, um, I'm sorry, here's the relevant provision, just screenshotted. We looked at some Moderna press releases um, or all Moderna press releases, excuse me, describing the vaccine candidate, and none of them complied with this obligation. So we wrote a letter to Gary Dispro, the, actor, the acting director of BARDA, and asked that he ensure that Moderna complies with this obligation because this is very important information that Moderna is contractually obligated to disclose. Um, Axios and Stat News covered the story, and the former director of BARDA retweeted it, and shortly thereafter, BARDA responded. And BARDA has been pretty responsive throughout this process um, and said that BARDA would look into the situation and that it values transparency and accountability to the American people. Um, so a later, shortly thereafter, a Moderna press release um, excerpted here said that BARDA is, re BARDA is reimbursing Moderna for 100% of the allowable costs under the contract. Basically, Moderna is not putting up anything. BARDA is covering 100% of the cost of developing the joint NIH Moderna vaccine candidate. Um, finding out about the cost sharing in the Regeneron OTA was easier because we just looked at an SEC filing where Re Re Regeneron itself revealed um, to the SEC that HHS is obligated to fund 80% of the costs incurred for research and development. Um, and that's for Regeneron's um, therapeutic candidate that was just taken by President Trump. 
Why does this matter? Well, the fact that the government and charities are effectively de-risking companies' investments in vaccines and treatments for COVID-19 should be reflected in the purchase price of the vaccines and the terms of the funding agreements. But as far as we can tell, this is not the case. Okay, lastly, I will transition to the procurement contracts just really quickly. Um, these are even larger awards of a billion to $2 billion to advance purchase hundreds of millions of doses of the vaccine candidates before they're proven safe and effective. And notably, these contracts have not been entered into by the US government. The government has entered into a contract with Advanced Technology International and or ATI, and ATI has entered into the contracts with the contractors. Um, here are some of the purchase agreements, um, and you can see the large amounts of money that have been awarded. All but the Moderna contract were executed by Advanced Technology International rather than by the U.S. government. Now, what is Advanced Technology International? It calls itself a collaboration management firm, and it's been used by DOD since 2016 to facilitate the Medical CBRN Defense Consortium, or MCDC, which is used to develop products um, for DOD personnel, like I said. Curiously, like I said before, um, Operation Mort Speed is using ETI and MCDC to enter into COVID-19 purchase agreements for Novavax, J&J, &J, Pfizer, and Sanofi. And the agreement between DOD and ATI to do this is another transaction agreement. Um, so I, we, I discovered this or was working with an NPR reporter, Sydney Lepkin, um, because she let me know that she had submitted a FOIA request to BARDA for the Novavax vaccine purchase agreement. And BARDA said that it didn't have a copy of the agreement, even though BARDA said that it was a party to this agreement. So she found that very strange. And we found out that Novavax in an SEC filing was saying that the contract was with ATI. Um, so this is a snippet from, or a clip from her news coverage of the story. She asked ATI why it would be used in this manner when ATI is usually used to develop products just for DOD personnel in these COVID-19 19 vaccines are for all civilians. And ATI said something like, oh, well, we already had the membership in place, so it was just easier to do this. But Novavax joined the MCDC consortium this summer, so that doesn't really hold water. Why this is concerning? OTAs lack the safeguards that were built into the government contracting process to give the government rights and IP and data and protect taxpayers. Um, and with the pandemic, you want access as equitable and widespread as possible. You want to make sure that the government has retained certain rights in the, the vaccines and treatments. Um, when an OTA and intermediary is used, it is unclear whether those rights are preserved. But um, the last slide is that the government can set reasonable prices. We did find a Novavax SEC filing that, state, that states as follows. Um, it's kind of a long quote, but at the end it says that if Novavax in the United States are negotiating an extension of a contract and they don't reach an agreement, the US government has the discretion to unilaterally determine a fair and reasonable price for completion of the definitive agreement. And we found that very noteworthy because the US government usually says it doesn't have the confidence to determine a fair and reasonable price. And clearly it does. I know I covered a lot of ground in a short amount of time. If you have any questions, please reach out.